welcome to Work in Progress, the conversation series of the New Institute from the construction site of the future home of the New Institute at the Babo Ensemble in Hamburg. And I'm very happy to um, welcome today Sir Paul Collier from Oxford University, a partner in the Value and Values program that we're about to start this fall in collaboration with Oxford and other partners. Um, Paul is here to talk about his new book, There's Greed, and to look beyond what is in this book uh, analyzed as the failure of homo economicus or economic man in the individualistic market-driven or good market environment of the last, say, 40 years. Um, so, Paul, the analysis in the book is quite damning and clear. You've written it with your fellow economist, John Kay, and explained the wrong incentives of homo economicus, of individualistic um, worldview based on some sort of the, I don't know, wrong interpretation, I guess, of Darwinism. The good mark is that a consequence of that, the rise in inequality, divided societies. But looking ahead, as we want to do in the new institute, uh, to what a different future could look like, be constructive, optimistic, in 2000, 2030 or 2040 or beyond, what would an ideal society look like in your mind? Well, thank, first of all, thanks for inviting me on. Um, and uh, now the book, Greed is Dead, is quite a hopeful book. Um, in the end, it's, it starts with a critique of all that's been wrong, um, and there's plenty of that. Um, but it's, um, it's a hopeful book because uh, it's, uh, it points to the fact that um, that homo economicus description of human nature is actually a travesty of reality. Um, and so we're all, uh, we're mammals, um, like other mammals, um, but we're a very unusual mammal. Um, we're much, much more pro-social. Um, we choose to bond into groups. Um, uh, we take a lot of our decisions probably most of them influenced by the collective brain of the community rather than our individual brains. And all that's for the good. Um, because what we need to do um, in all societies to have a good society is to be able to build common purpose within a community, as big a community as possible, the building forward-looking common purpose. And um, COVID's an excellent example of that. Here was a new um, problem, a really contagious disease. There was the need to build a new common purpose very fast. Some societies managed to build it, um, uh, and some didn't. And let me give you a contrast between um, Denmark um, uh, where uh, I know the Prime Minister of Denmark, Ed Fredrickson, um, um, quite a humble woman, um, but she was able to, she was trusted by citizens to build a new common purpose. And as I think was, was your own Chancellor, um, and, uh, and that new common purpose was um, please um, protect your fellow citizens, and in particular, protect your neighbours. Um, don't endanger the life of your neighbours by spreading the disease. Now, if we look to the highly individualistic environment of America, what do we see as the first reactions to COVID? We see queues outside gun shops, long queues. And so America was less a protect your neighbour than a shoot your neighbour. But shoot your neighbour actually doesn't walk very well. So if you um, talk about COVID, you would see that crises like COVID or maybe also the climate crisis can actually change um, how humans see themselves in a, in a larger context in the term of COVID, in, in the context of COVID in a community context, but maybe in climate change context, also in the time context that you see what's your responsibility to, towards the future. Do we need crisis like that to, to really achieve that necessary change? 
I think we need a coincidence of, of two, two things. One is a change of the intellectual tide, new ideas, and the other is a, a crisis, a catalyzing event, which exemplifies what the intellectual current's about. Um, I'll point to another new book, um, not Greed is Dead, um, but, um, uh, but by the most brilliant political sociologist of, of America, Robert Putnam at Harvard, and his book Upswing charts the, the changing of intellectual ideas over the course of the last 120 years. And he shows that for the first 60 years of that period, um, American society was becoming less individualistic, more communitarian. Um, literally, one of his measures is the use of we or the use of me. The we-me ratio. And we-me starts very low in the year 1900, peaks in the 1960s, and by 2020 is back very low again. We're living, in a, or America's living, in a me-me-me society at the moment. Um, and he establishes the idea of an inflection point, a point at which, instead of building community, you start to undermine and destroy community, or the other way around. Um, and he identifies the 60s as the inflection point when communities stopped being built and started being destroyed. Um, I think we're at another inflection point now because we've got that combination. There are a whole raft of books like Greed is Dead, but in political sociology, in evolutionary biology, in philosophy, like Michael Sandel's new book, The Tyranny of Merit, all these wonderful books are pointing in the same direction. So there's definitely a changing of the intellectual tide, but there's also with COVID and climate change, a real material crisis where we need to build a new common purpose. And so that combination of something that really obviously matters, combined with a shifting of ideas, which is what the intellectual tide is about, that will change things. And so, yes, I think we are, an, another title for greed is dead, which probably would have been a better title, is Peak Greed. Because we think, at the moment, our society, certainly British society, is a peak greed. We'll be gradually drifting away from that individualism towards a more communitarian approach. So I'm interested in that um, account of, of communitarianism, as you say, in the 20th century, how it, how it worked and played out. Um, um, one question is, is, do you need to look back or is that the inflection point? So you say that you look back at what worked and, and take that into the future. And then what do you take from that analysis? Because I think there are two possible sort of explanations of individualism, as you sort of point out, is the main, in your mind, um, obstacle or, or danger to, to building a community or functional community or cohesive community a network of relationships. Uh, one is the 60s, as you say, so that's more the cultural explanation, I guess, and one would be the 80s, which is maybe more the straightforward economic explanation, um, Thatcherism or Reagan um, in the US. How do you value those two factors? Right. So, first of all, we can't, we don't know, and we can't tell. Um, uh, a modern society, any society, um, everything is dependent on everything else. It's all interconnected. So the idea that there's one root cause, which then triggers everything else, is, is naive mischaracterization, really. If everything's interdependent, then to change things, you need a big, broad push. You need ideas to change in a range of different areas, um, but, but at the same time. And you need some major events that say, wake up. Right, um, and I think we're at such a moment. That's why I'm really very hopeful. Um, um, uh, America, for example, is manifestly plunging, um, not just into COVID and uh, climate crisis. It's plunging into 
socio-political disaster um, on its streets. You know, they needed more troops on the ground in order to inaugurate a president uh, um, in, in, in earlier this month um, than the um, than they had uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq. I think you know, so it was ludicrous. Um, the society is broken down, um, and that's just one example of it. In Britain with Brexit, the same thing, um, a, you know, a, a sort of catastrophe. Um, which is a wake-up call. Something's gone badly wrong when societies um, produce this sort of disaster. Um, so, so if we so if we if we look ahead, um, um, I would be interested in you spell out in the book at the end very specific measures or, or trajectories for, for example, government or the state, which which you see uh, critical in the past and constructive. In the future, in some way, could you explain how you would, would so, view, view the ideal all, state? Yeah, so first of all, we don't need to return to the past. It's not that sort of language that is a mistake, right? Societies are dynamic, they're always um, moving forward, and uh, the problems are always somewhat different. So uh, every turnaround is a unique event. You can't just follow a textbook from what happened last time. Um, but some things are in common. And one is that um, uh, you need more than uh, individuals maximizing their own individual self-interest and a state um, meeting all obligations. We know that doesn't work. These highly centralized states supposedly meeting all obligations. Well, that was communism. Huh? Um, it didn't work. It didn't work anywhere. And it didn't work spectacularly bad. You know, it was, it, um, and they keep trying it. At the moment it's Venezuela. Just look at it, right? Um, so these highly centralized states, um, uh, where no other actor is sort of morally load bearing, that really doesn't work. And so in the book, we point to two big types of community, both of which have to work. Communities of place and communities of work, business. Um, communities of place. Germany is a model here because you're so um, decentralized. And Hamburg is a superb model because it's uh, a lot of power has been decentralized to Hamburg. And, um, and it's very successful, it works. Um, that is, uh, you know, people don't wake up in the morning in Hamburg saying, oh, I wish I was in Berlin. Right? Um, Some do, but, uh, <laughs> not, I, no, but, but I get your point. But it's, it's uh, interesting to, to think about, but we could come back to that. So if, is it federalism or is it something even more granular, even more local? Community yeah. works at many different levels, right? With, with COVID, we needed to work in a neighborhood. Yeah. You either um, infect the people in your street or you don't. Um, uh, and so it can, but, but, um, uh, community can work at many, many different levels and they're not alternatives. You, 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 you can build community um, you know, so that you, you identify uh, some obligations to your street, some obligations to your city, some obligations to your region, some obligations to your country, and some obligations to larger entities, whether it's Europe or the world. Right? For some purposes, by climate change, we need to identify with the world. And for other purposes, like spreading COVID, we need to identify with the street. Um, and so um, these are compatible. Can I ask you about this word obligation? So, because that's a key word, of course, if you, if you, if you feel an obligation. And your assumption is that it's in our nature that we feel this obligation and it hasn't been fostered, it has been repressed in some way in how to think about society or markets uh, for that matter. Yeah, so it's, because it's the question, how can you, how can you build an obligation out of presumably nothing, but, but you say, no, there's, there's something. Yeah, so Love. first of all, um, um, it's not an assumption. Um, modern evolutionary biology has shown decisively that we're a very unusual type of mammal, um, unusually pro-social, um, unusually 
concerned to bond with others and very much wanting the approval of others in our community. And that desire for approval of others in the community, that's the sort of social glue um, which makes us stick to common purpose. So it's not an assumption. Now, of course, we're also um, a mammal, um, like any other. Um, uh, in the book, I talk about my cat, um, um, Grisou, and she exemplifies Homo economicus. She's not a match, she's not a person, she's a cat. But by goodness, she's greedy, she's lazy, and she's selfish. All three in the extreme. Yeah? So economists have built a very good model of how a cat behaves, but a lousy model of how humans behave. Um, There's a brilliant new book by the evolutionary biologist Joe Heinrich, the head of the department at Harvard, which says all that. Um, so it's not an assumption, but um, our institutions, our organizations, can either drag us back towards these crude instincts of the cat or encourage us forward into the much nobler instincts that Heinrich identifies as perfectly normal in all of us. Um, and Germany has done a much better job than Britain, I think, at building those, um, those institutions that encourage um, everybody to be morally low there. Okay, so we have a governmental approach or state that's, as you say, highly decentralized, um, relying on other bonds, um, more like fine associations, um, a network of, of relationships, and you have an individual that's revolutionary disposed towards doing good, actually, or, or, or caring for, for the other. That's good news. Um, so what does that mean for the marketplace or for, for business or corporations as such, which, which are in... in, in, in Intermediaries, I guess, in, in that Look, sense. There, there are two important organizations which dominate our lives. Communities of place, which we just talked about, which can be at many different levels, and, and communities of work. And communities of work, um, I'm, on, I'm in one, it's called Oxford University, um, uh, but a lot of people are in private sector, in, in firms. Um, without firms, um, we'd all starve to death and shiver to death. Um, so firms are absolutely fundamental to a modern society. Um, but the idea that firms just exist to make a profit, um, and that's all they need to worry about, which was Milton Friedman's view in the 1970s, that is now roundly rejected, um, even by um, the most you know the most brilliant economists. So. Uh, I, talk, I point to um, Raghu Rajan, the professor of um, finance at the uh, University of Chicago. University of Chicago was the home of that man, right? Um, uh, professor Rajan is the apex of the um, professorial economist world. He was both the chief economist at the IMF, he was the governor of the Reserve Bank of India, He's top professor in Chicago, and he's come out with a book called The Third Pillar. And what's the third pillar? It's community. And he says the reason why America hasn't been working very well is that we've neglected that third pillar community. Yeah. Um, or we could go to uh, Rebecca Henderson, Harvard Business School's top professor. Harvard Business School, home of Homo economicus, we might think. But her new book, Reimagining Capitalism in a World on Fire, is a peon for praise for community and for morally responsible business. And so, of course, nobody working in a firm gets up in the morning and says, today, I've got to maximize shareholder value. Nobody ever gets out of bed for that. Okay. It's an absurd. That was that was Friedman's proposition. It was completely absurd. Yeah. Um, it's just psychologically totally false. Um, uh, and so, why do people work in a firm? Mostly, 
because they get some sense of purpose larger than just themselves and the paycheck. Um, uh, you know, so, and so, so, so what, purpose is, purpose is of course an important word, so both for the employer and the employee, so if you, you point that out and we can discuss that because that's such a almost a buzzword, so of purpose economy. Um, I would be interested in that, but also in, in your skepticism towards industrial democracy, because you you say shareholder value was the wrong incentive, but you also don't believe that industrial democracy, ownership, co-ownership of, of businesses is an interesting model. Um, can you explain that a little? Yeah, I think um, um, the, the, the model that, that, that I tend to favor is one in, in the ducking. John K. tends to favor. He, he was the founding director of Oxford's business school, so you know, he's, 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 he's not a dope on business. Um, um, what we prefer is the idea of having a, a sort of legal responsibility of all the board of directors to, to combine the uh, commercial interests of the firm with the um, with the social interest, and so at a minimum, no firm should meet a commercial interest by um, uh, damaging society, um, uh, making a profit at the expense of society is is not a proper purpose for business. But beyond that, um, uh, it's a balancing act. All these decisions are balancing between different interests. And rather than have one person on the board that represents the climate interest and one person representing the female interest and another person representing some other interest, the worker interest, um, it's much better if all of them are legally required to say, your, your job as a director is to balance these interests sensibly, um, getting the knowledge that's needed to, to think forward and balance and come up with a, a, def a, a, a defensible set of decisions which you can explain to people and do explain to people in terms of why this is a sensible way forward given the many purposes that the firm and the many interests that the, the firm needs to meet. And how do you achieve that? What are the mechanisms? Where is the place for that um, understanding? It's not in rights, you point out in the book. It's in, it's in common purpose, common sense in some way, but, but how can you create that? Um, you create a common purpose uh, through dialogue. A dialogue is a particular type of communication. It's a bit analogous to playing ping pong. Um, ping pong, when you, when you decide to play ping pong, um, you step up to the table with a bat, um, but you agree some rules. You want to win, you're playing to win, um, but you agree that you can't just go around the table and win by hitting your opponent on the head with your bat. Yeah? Um, uh, and similarly with dialogue, dialogue presupposes um, that you're there to understand the other, to listen to the other, as well as speak to the other, and try and forge some common understanding of a problem. You might not end up agreeing, but through that common understanding of a problem, you then rather naturally turn to, well, how can we go about solving it? And that's building some forward-looking common strategy. Um, which gradually you build towards agreement. That's very much incidentally a Japanese style of conversation in a Japanese business. Um, it's a continuous dialogue where people work towards a sort of common purpose. Um, that's healthy and it's natural. Um, but it's not what we've got in places like America and Britain at the moment, um, which are where public discourse is an arena for insulting your opponent. And so dialogue is this much more bounded, purposeful conversation. Which again, I guess, if, if you talk about values as is um, part of the program at the New Institute, the question is, is it again, values that are 
social values, I mean, you might, my answer might be, there's no clear <laughs> one way or another, but I'm just interested in the relationship. Is it social values so that, that would be sort of set in the 60s, or is it values that are created by incentives to, as you say, maximize profits for other interests than the public or, 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 or the common it's well, in some ways? Uh, clearly, um, the, the, the over-financialization of recent years um, was a was a dreadful force for pushing firms into short term uh, profit maximization, which was no good for anybody, least of all the firms. Um, so there's clearly some public policies that uh, can be can be changed um, to uh, permit forward looking common purpose. Really, these sort of dialogues. Um, but if we look at the performance of firms, um, really, pretty well all the firms that have lasted for a century have done so um, through building some common purpose. Um, uh, the firms that, um, that try and um, maximize short-term profits live very precariously. Um, I point to um, uh, Bear Stearns, which was a, uh, you know, a, an investment bank. Um, I say it was an investment bank because it was the first investment bank to go bankrupt. Yeah. You know, their mission statement uh, in their lobby was, we make nothing but money. Well, that's not a really, not a very uplifting statement, is it? Think, who, think of the sort of people that were attracted to that firm. We make nothing but money. Um, unfortunately, the sort of people who really said, oh, yeah, that's me, um, were people who added two little words at the end of that. Um, we make nothing but money for ourselves. Um, and that's what they did. Um, they discovered that they could get the bonus, the annual bonus from the firm, by taking big risks, which would blow up after they got their bonus. And so who blew up their sterns, the first to go bankrupt? It's employees. They took on deals which blew up. Right? So it's not even a good strategy for firms. Um, they can't attract the sort of workforce which will actually work for the purpose of the firm. So uh, the purpose economy or economy of purpose in, in a larger context or in Germany specifically has shown that you can have these um, multiple somehow interesting alliances I guess of people who, who share that understanding. Could you explain your view on that? I mean that seems to be very important to drive for change to have these unlikely new alliances. How do you foresee that in your vision of a, of a better society? Yes I think well this is what um, um, dialogue at its best brings, has to be inclusive so it brings in all the, the different community, small communities right so it's a, a, a dialogue at a national level or at a, at a city level is a um, is a community of communities um, uh, so for example the um, the public sector employees will typically have a rather different um, view of things from um, from 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 the, the people, the chief executives of businesses, talking with each other, they will discover that they disagree on some things, but they but, but often that will be because they understand situations differently, and through trying to build mutual understanding, you start to discover the things on which you actually agree. It turns out that some of the things on which you think are fundamental and disagree turn out not to be fundamental. Um, uh, following my book, um, a, uh, a professor of psychology got in touch with me from London, and, um, and on one thing, we both did, we really disagreed, and each of us thought it was fundamental. And then we sat down and talked, and we discovered 
It wasn't fundamental at all. Um, we could do just fine agreeing what needed to be done. Um, whilst parking that disagreement, it didn't materially affect us. And to create those values, um, you say, on the one hand, you don't want to go back to what was before, and you can't have that so social cohesion, I guess, in, in the 60s. And that's also, in, in a lot of ways, I guess, um, a blind spot of Putnam's, maybe that it's uh, also a, a much segregated society, I guess. So, so that that is that that is changed in, in a lot of ways, in in a, in a more pluralistic sense. Do you feel that there's this additional difficulty to create that common purpose? What are the obstacles that you see beyond individualism, individualism or or the me cult? Are there other factors that make it hard? No, first of all, it's certainly not a blind spot with Putnam. Um, he has whole chapters devoted to um, both to racial integration and to gender integration. Um, and of course, he's not advocating going back to the 1960s, but what he does show is that the pace of progress, both on gender and on race, the pace of progress between 1900 and 1960 was actually faster than the pace of progress between 1960 and 2020. Of course, we made some progress in gender equality and racial equality since 1960, but the pace of progress through individualism and protest, my rights, has actually been slower than the pace of progress from the terrible situation in 1900 to the very much improved situation by 1960. So we're not aiming, nobody's aiming to return to the 1960s, but we're aiming to, to recreate the sort of um, communitarian uh, mutual uh, understanding that enabled that rapid progress in the first half of the 120 years, which slowed even in the things that we most care about, the gender equality, uh, the racial equality, though the progress didn't accelerate, it actually slowed. Um, which might also maybe lead to some discontent. I mean, that, that is... Yes, exactly. Maybe, uh, exactly. No wonder. No yeah. wonder. We have all the uh, anger. Um, you know, America is a, a society that's deeply angry about an awful lot of things. It's race, gender, um, uh, educational, the, the educational class divide, um, the, the spatial divide between the successful metropoles and the broken cities. So it's a bitterly divided society, much more so than it used to be. And, but in, but this, this point that communitarian approaches of building dialogue are actually a very good vehicle for healing whatever the divides are, because everybody gets a voice based on the assumption that they should be listened to and understood. And then you try and forge from these mutual understandings some mutually understood way forward. Uh, good leadership really helps there. And there's a big difference between communitarian leaders and individualist leaders. Individualist leaders come forward and say, the solution is me. I'm the genius here. I'm smart. I'm smarter than you. I know what to do best. And so, I'm the commander-in-chief. I'm going to pull all these levers and, hey, presto, things will be great. Right? That's an individualist leader. I'm smarter than the rest of you. And so I've got the power. I'm going to use it. A communitarian leader doesn't do that. Like Meta Fredrickson in Denmark. She doesn't say, I'm smarter than you. Very far from it. Right? Um, she does sacrifice her own interest in the interest of the whole. 
And that's the key feature of a communitarian leader. Um, they walk the talk. They talk about the, the interest of the community, but they themselves live in the way that reveals that they're committed to it. That way, they become trusted by ordinary citizens or members of their community, members of their uh, firm, members of their university. Once they're trusted, they can be something much, much more important than a commander-in-chief. They can be the communicator-in-chief. They can reset the ideas that buzz in people's head because people not only hear them, but trust them to be, to be right in what they're saying. And so really good leadership that takes the community forward is that rather modest, deprecating leadership, as a step of humor typically, um, and, uh, and, and is trusted to bring in the new ideas, which, for example, um, managed to contain COVID, um, or managed to uh, reduce uh, carbon emissions. These are the sort of leaders we need for the future. Um, I'm interested in um, your take on representative democracy or direct democracy and the role of technology in that. In the book, it's, it's, it's mentioned that it, technology can facilitate more direct democracy. Um, still, you're very skeptical or, or more in favor of representative democracy. Can you explain your take on that? I, I think the, um, it's worth exploring with more, um, more direct democracy, I think. Um, I mean, Switzerland's done pretty well by a big dose of direct democracy. Um, um, but, the, but the danger with direct democracy is that um, complex decisions um, generally requires some people to make quite a big investment in understanding them. Um, so together with participation in direct voting comes a responsibility to get up to speed in the issues. Um, there's quite an interesting compromise that, um, uh, that Ireland has used, um, where on, on a particular issue, they'll get a thousand people to come together, randomly chosen. Um, so representative across society, and then they spend six months um, uh, calling evidence, just getting up to speed on an issue. And then we see what consensus emerges from that thousand people. So that's a sort of using a new technology, um, but uh, trying to build an informed society. So where democracy really doesn't work, uh, is if we hand power of decision to people who are very badly informed. Um, so, um, so it, it's um, wise decisions uh, are what we need, um, and wise decisions require this integration of um, of the, the knowledge that each person has about their own particular situation, together with the knowledge that experts have. Um, it's very dangerous if just experts take decisions. That's the highly centralized state um, at its best. At its worst, the highly centralized state is run by idiots, but at best it's run by experts. Still dangerous because the experts don't have any of that contextual knowledge that you get from lived experience. So the best way forward is some mechanism by sharing the expert knowledge with a larger group, potentially with everybody, um, or with a group of representatives who are representatives. So the representative democracy rather than direct democracy works, but only if the representatives really are just that, representative. In Britain, they cease to be. You, you talk in your book um and your previous books as well, um, Future of Capitalism, a lot about narratives. Um, what's the, is there one counter-narrative? Homo economicus was the name for the old one. Is there a name or like a short description for the new one, the more altruistic, 
He said, Human. What are, first of all, what are narratives? Narratives are um, coming three types. One is they can tell you who you are. I did narratives about identity. One is they can tell you about how your world works, um, causal structures. If this happens, then that happens. Uh, and the other is, is um, uh, narratives about norms. This is what a person like you ought to do. Um, we need all three. We overwhelmingly we um, get our ideas through narratives, not through textbooks. Right? Um, we're hardwired to be able to remember narratives. Um, as a teacher, I learned that. Right? that you, 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 you get ideas across best by setting an analytic idea into the context of a story. We try and do that with our books. Um, uh, so um, all societies function by narratives. America at the moment has got this ghastly narratives um, um, which teach people my identity is that I'm totally different from anybody else. Right? Um, it teaches people uh, a mis perception of causality and a terrible misperception of norms of what of what we, uh, what is a what is a good person what what is a person like me supposed to be doing shooting my neighbor right um, and so a good leader a leader a communitarian leader really takes by these narratives and people can then coordinate their behavior by sharing, buying into and hearing and trusting the same narrative. And so at their best, uh, a leader resets narratives so that a whole community, big community, um, shares this common understanding of who they are, we're all a we, not just a me. We all understand how our world works, so here's our strategy is to our purpose and the norm that we all have to do, which is mutuality. Other people are going to do their bit, and I must do my bit. So that's the role of narratives in coordinating this forward looking common Paul, well, that. We're on the construction side, so uh, it's getting a bit noisy uh, slowly, and um, I think uh, we've also explored very well the, the context of um, of this conversation of this of this huge topic of how a different society could could look like we tend to um, sometimes ask a personal question in the end or I'm, or I'm, um, it also connects to what you said sort of about narratives and it, it, it would feature a, a me or an I but I think that's for the for that purpose okay if you could tell me this context of what we talked about, for me, this is personal because, can you finish that sentence? Okay, indeed, um, because quite by chance, I've straddled the bitter divides that beset our societies. Both of my parents left school when they were 12. I've got more education than most. Uh, I'm now in what is supposedly one of the top universities in the world as a professor. But my relatives back in Sheffield, uh, which became a broken city, um, all of your audience will have seen the film The Full Moon, which is about the collapse of a once proud city into tragedy. So I've had one foot in the world of the very educated and one foot in the world of the very much less educated. I've had one foot in the most booming city in Britain. My postcode has the highest house prices relative to income of any place in Britain. Um, and I've got another foot back in Sheffield in a broken city where my relatives are very far from my own good fortune. And that has cleared my soul. I think these bitter divides are avoidable and must be reversed. And so that's why 
there's a passion and a purpose to what I'm trying to do. And I'm very proud to be part of Value and Values. And I was, your, the noise, the building noise that we kept interrupting us was the one's purpose of noise. It wasn't just traffic, it was building a better future. And I want to be part of it. Lovely, can't wait to see you once uh, we all can travel again and, and meet in Hamburg. Um, thank, thank you so much, you. Paul. And yeah, we'll continue this conversation in, um, in a more per personal and purpose-driven way in the future. Thank Thanks you. Thanks very much for having me on.